Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar. We're pleased you can join us and our three fantastic speakers to discuss the unbundling of the Pago markets. Now I'm told this is a record number of registrants for a Google webinar. So this is clearly a topic that captures people's attention. And uh, great to have so many people uh, joining us today. I can see the number of attendees is, uh, is going up uh, and up. Cool. So my name is Drew Corbin. I'm the Program Manager for Quality and Consumer Protection at Gogler, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. And this webinar has been uh, co-created by Gogler and BFA. And for anyone who isn't familiar, uh, Gogler is the industry association for the off-grid solar industry. And we have 135 members who are, are active in the off-grid solar industry, uh, manufacturers, distributors, technology service providers, and uh, investors and other, um, other people with an interest in the sector. It's our mission to build sustainable commercial markets that provide quality and affordable uh, off-grid solar products to the 2 billion people on the planet living in off-grid or weak grid areas. And we're really pleased to be working with BFA on this webinar. Uh, the, the Fibre Programme, uh, which sits under BFA, has done lots of cool work on technology innovation. And we'll be hearing more from Jacob shortly. He'll give us an introduction to the, this unbundling phenomenon and some of the, the market trends before we move on to a panel discussion with two leaders in the PAYGO sector. That's Angaza and PEG Africa, who will share some of their experiences and insights and then we will have opportunity for for you the audience uh, to to ask questions cool and also this this webinar marks the launch of a technology and business innovation showcase series which is something that uh, we at Golder are really excited about uh, we're planning a series of webinars uh, blogs and events to showcase some of the, the, the exciting uh, technology and business innovation in the sector, really show off um, what our members are, uh, are doing on these fronts and uh, try and promote innovation, learning, create more, more linkages within the sector. So as I said, this is the, the first of a, of a new series, something of a, of a pilot in its own right. And um, yeah, we, we look forward to doing more uh, in 2019. So watch this space for upcoming events. Questions have come in in the, in the question. This webinar is being recorded and will be on the Google site after the event. Uh, please do put them in the, in the box and you'll be top of the list when we get to the Q&A. If the question is for a particular, particular panel, please indicate this and um, then I can direct, uh, direct the question accordingly. Cool. So the theme of this webinar is around um, how unbundling of the, the PAYGO business model is, is driving market expansion. And this is something that we've seen, um, you know, over the last, last few years. Just five years ago, new entrants to the PAYGO market were all vertically integrated. Everyone did everything. They had the proprietary hardware, software, uh, distribution business, and consumer financing. But times have changed. Um, there's now more than 100 companies active in the, in the PAYGO markets. There's manufacturers, um, software uh, providers, specialist tech firms, distributors, uh, a whole range of, uh, of companies that are uh, specializing on different 
different business models and uh, creating the, their own niche. And this has led to um, an expansion, you know, beyond the, the initial Pago countries in East Africa, you know, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and it's now, um, you can now find, um, you know, Pago offering in more than 35 countries. So going beyond East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And there's now more than 2.5 million Pago customers. Um, you know, considering back in 2012, 2013, there was a base of virtually zero. You know, that's a fairly rapid trajectory. And this webinar is exploring how unbundling of the Pago technology and business model is driving this market expansion. So what do we mean by market expansion? Just this, more companies, more countries, more companies, new types of companies, and more customers. Cool, so that's it for my introduction. I'm now gonna pass over to Jacob uh, from uh, BFA, and the, the Fiber program, who's gonna tell us more about this unbundling program, sorry, this unbundling process before we go to the panel discussion. Now, as a way of uh, introduction, Jacob is a senior associate with BFA and been leading some of the, the work that they've been doing with, um, with distributors and manufacturers um, around this, this unbundling process. So it's got a really interesting uh, perspective and some strong experience to, to share with us. And if you haven't already read Jacob's blog on Medium, I certainly encourage you to do so. Jacob, let me pass you the floor. You are muted, I believe, self-muted. Now, how does it look? Can you see my That's screen and hear me? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. All right, thanks, Drew. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, this is kind of an overview of what I want to try to cover um, in about 15 minutes. So I want to kind of give an overview of unbundling, how it's been happening in the Pago sector, talk about the implications for market expansion and some of the things that we've learned in the last two years in our work in, in the Pago space. Um, and as Drew mentioned, um, I'm leading BFA's work in energy. We're a global consulting firm focused on financial inclusion. We've been actively working in off-grid solar for about two years, um, mainly through the fiber program, which is financial inclusion on business runways, which is a BFA uh, managed project that's funded by the MasterCard Foundation. Um, and we focus on using smartphones and data to accelerate financial inclusion. And we've been focused on two sectors, um, pay as you go and small merchants. And so what we get to do is bring our diverse team and solutions to projects that we run directly with Pago operators and financial institutions. And uh, this is how we operate in the Pago sector. So we, we typically work in six to eight month uh, fiber projects um, where we work with an operator or a financial institution. Um, on the right side of this slide, you'll see we've We've done longer engagements with, um, with PEG in Ghana, with Zola in Tanzania, with Bright Life and Finca in Uganda. And then we've had um, four smaller, what we call nano projects, which are about one or two months with Angaza, BioLite, Sun Culture, and Lindable. Um, and so you can see that a lot of these are, are, are second generation Pago companies um, in, in one way, shape, or form. Um, and on the left side of this slide is kind of a, a description of what we've been doing as BFA. Um, we've, we've focused kind of a, across three areas, digitizing field operations um, and using data for smarter agent network management. Um, we've really worked across the spectrum of data in Pago credit operations from point of sale, customer selection, to analytics, and including building models to predict churn. And then we've um, 
uh, we've been building more recently relationships with financial institutions that leverage the pay-go asset and repayment behavior as the on-ramp for an in-consumer to be brought into a formal financial institution. So I'm gonna give a quick intro to unbundling and then jump immediately into what it means for our space. So a quick definition um, in pretty simple terms, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is technology unbundling. Um, and unbundling is the disaggregation, which you can think of as the breaking up of a product or a service into standalone offerings. And it's typically at a time or in a place where it was not previously viable to do that um, separately. And so in Pago, we're really at, um, I think, an interesting point in unbundling key pieces of the technology that makes Pago possible um, that is allowing a lot of different companies to specialize and allowing companies to decouple pieces of their business models, which I'll get into exactly how that's happening in the next few slides, but wanted to start with kind of this definition. And so this is kind of a condensed um, version of what's a pretty complicated Pago value chain in many ways. I think you can, you can think of each of these categories as separate business lines. Um, but along the value chain in, in white, you know, you'll see some of the activities that a, a company needs to do under each component, right? Design and manufacture products. You've got to acquire customers, deliver products to them. Um, you have all of the activities under a consumer financing business and, of course, everything around consumer customer support. Um, and then in the gray at the bottom, um, you'll see the supporting digital tools for each of those to make Pago possible. So you'll need remote lockout hardware for the solar hardware to be turned on and off. Um, you need corresponding software um, required to do that. Um, you'll need tools to manage inventory and to register customers out in the field and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as Drew mentioned in the beginning, you know, just four or five years ago, you probably only had a handful of companies um, that had this entire value chain owned and had built their own technology solutions for all of these digital tool requirements. And so before signing up you know, your first customer, if you wanted to start a business doing Pago four or five years ago, you really had to invest a lot of equity designing all of this from scratch. And, and so this is an example of what you um, might have seen in a vertically integrated Pago company. So in the kind of the, the green bar across the kind of middle there, is it may be hard to read in the slide, but that's really where they focus as a company is completely across that value chain. Own hardware, own distribution, own consumer financing, and they own customer support. And where they partner on the digital tool side is maybe only with mobile money providers um, and maybe an SMS provider. And so to make Pago possible for their customers, they had to build an own tech IP in-house for all of these functions. Um, and those digital tools are fully designed to their own needs, um, which can be very helpful, but it requires a huge amount of equity and um, you have to own the whole value chain, right? And so that comes to this concept of technology unbundling. So what, what exactly is it? Um, I like to think of it as that, you know, the, the, the three boxes at the top of this slide um, are really what's unbundling the rest of the technology and making it possible to decouple pieces of your business model. Um, and those three are really what's been the core of how you deliver Pago functionality to a piece of hardware. Um, so, you know, machine to machine technologies have been really scaling globally. And so that's made it a lot cheaper to create remote lockout hardware and to leverage that and apply that to solar hardware that companies have been manufacturing and distributing at scale for quite some time now. And so um, what groups like Angaza and Lumeter and Pagey and others were able to do is link up with forward thinking hardware manufacturers to integrate 
different remote lockout hardware into their devices. So now you as a hardware manufacturer would have the ability to make your product Pago ready or not, and not have to create that tech yourself. And then those companies then created corresponding software platforms that could plug into a wide range of solar hardware and different remote lockout technologies um, to manage accounts, to manage the token generation, um, manage repayment, um, and a lot of other things that they built around that. But with, with those three um, bundled, um, you've been able to see an acceleration of now other digital tools that are possible to unbundle um, uh, to support the rest of the Pago business. So you you know you could potentially go out and, and use off the shelf tools for building your own smartphone app. Um, you can look at off the shelf tools for inventory management. Um, and so there's been this real acceleration in the last few years towards modular software applications. And now you can start to take advantage of that. And so this is an example, I think, of what you might see in a second generation Pago player, or, or what we've sometime, sometimes referred to as Pago 2.0. So the yellow bar um, towards the middle of this slide is meant to sort of show where this company would focus. Like this particular company might decide they only want to do sales and distribution, uh, customer finance, and, and customer support. They're just going to buy hardware from partners. Um, in other cases, you might see um, a graph like this, where the, the second generation Pago company is just doing sales and distribution and customer support. And they've actually partnered with an MFI or uh, a rural bank to do the consumer finance. And so again, those core pieces of the Pago tech unbundling are making it possible to start to decouple um, pieces of the business and then this particular example, um, this company would start from scratch uh, with building an ecosystem of different partners, which are represented by these logos. Um, you know, from the left is kind of the, maybe their hardware partners. Um, they might use on Gaza for their Pago functionality and a different tool for some of their inventory. Um, they may have on Gaza integrated with mobile money, and then they may be using um, Zoho or one of these other tools for communicating with their customers. Um, and so the Pego 2.0 operator is able to launch very quickly because they don't need to build any of that from scratch. Um, and they don't need to maintain those technologies um, as a service. Um, and they're able to launch extremely quickly and for the most part have quite low software service costs. Um, and but I guess a point here is that we're we're still relatively early in unbundling, and so if you look back at the the different partners that that Pego 2.0 player is having to work with, um, each of these logos might be a potential third party application, and you may have to manage six or seven partnerships. Um, each of those partners has a digital tool that's storing data somewhere. Um, it often needs to flow between different tools and you need to figure out how to manage the integrations and then work hard to make sure the KPIs and dashboards are, are matched with what your business actually needs. And so, you know, all of that is to say that, that we are still early. There is still, still some level of complexity that can come with being unbundled. And a, a couple of the takeaways um, from our experience working with, um, you know, sort of Pago 2.0 companies that I, I thought I'd bring up here. Um, I, I think the first is that there's there's going to be constraints that are unique to each market, um, like, like the availability of local IT vendors, for example, that you should keep in mind when you're when you're designing that ecosystem of tools to support your business. Um, you know, you, you, you want to find those that, that best match your unique situation. And related to that, I would say that connectivity um, in the field with your workforce and with your customers is an issue that we've seen in almost every market. And so it can present some really big challenges. So just keep that in mind and, and try to really design for 
offline operations first, if possible. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that not everything is plug and play just yet. Um, and it's somewhat difficult if you need to switch. So I guess a hypothetical example would be if I wanted to sell four different Pago ready products and use multiple Pago platforms, there's no easy way to link those together right now. So I would need to manage multiple systems um, and, and sometimes the data would be in different structures. Um, and I guess a last point I would make is that, you know, new operators, um, you know, you don't need your own tech IP. You don't need a, a team of engineers to build that, but you do still need teams to manage software and manage data and make sure that your digital tools are all collect, you know, connected and working well and that you're gathering robust data. Um, and I think new, new Pago companies, a recommendation I would have is that, you know, don't, don't hesitate to reach out and get support from your tech partners and from some of the emerging kind of service providers. And I've actually been really pleasantly surprised by how willing second generation players are to share um, and kind of help each other in the spirit of growing the market. So, so I would also make that um, as a suggestion. And, and what I'm trying to communicate here is that um, a big benefit of, of unbundling is it's enabling specialization. Uh, this graphic is, I think, a little bit simplified, um, but you can have companies that focus just on Pago-ready hardware, some you know, that uh, focus on just distribution and consumer financing. Um, you know, there are solutions that support different pieces of the Pago value chain, like credit scoring. You have service providers like Open Capital and Catalyst as an IT solution provider. Um, so there's a lot of different types of businesses now. Um, that can specialize on, on pieces of, of the value chain, and that's really been enabled by um, technology unbundling. Um, and, and finally, I, I think with this slide, um, I, I wanted to kind of talk, bring this back to the, the topic here, which is really wh what are the impacts of this on market expansion? I think the first most obvious one is that there are now dozens of Pago ready products available in not just off-grid solar, but now a growing number of Pago-ready products in water and cooking. Um, and, and the second big benefit is, I think, to the space is that we've really reduced the, the amount of funding that 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 funders that investors need to put into financing what is effectively the same tech. Um, and and so I mentioned before this this specialization. It's it's really allowing companies to laser focus on a few things. Um, and it's even giving vertically integrated players the opportunity to pause and think about if they should unbundle pieces. Um, I, I was just doing some research before this and, and read that even, you know, MCOPA, which is one of the early vertically integrated players, has, has um, worked with Microsoft on their, with their Kaizala app. Um, so a smartphone app to support management of their workforce, something that they were doing in-house. And so, it's just showing you that that this is kind of accelerating and even vertically integrated players are looking at areas where they can um, unbundle. Um, I, I think the, the work that the, the Pago platforms like, like Pagey and Angaza and Solaris, et cetera, have done with digital payment integra integrations has had a huge impact um, on market expansion because uh, that's a very expensive and time-consuming process, and, and doing that on behalf of a lot of different operators um, really helps. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, 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 I think there's there's a, a, a big diversity of types of businesses that are able to now launch Pago offerings, um, and and you know, we're seeing Pago being launched in dozens of markets outside of East Africa, as, as Drew mentioned. And I think that's that's something that would have been really hard if, um, if this was really just being led by vertically integrated players, because it would be tough for them to justify the investment to go to all 40 of the markets where, where, where Pago is now. Um, so I've gone over a couple minutes, I apologize for that. But um, if you're working on any of these area, in any of these areas, we would be very interested to learn more. Um, and I would just, invite you to reach out. We'll, we'll provide the slides after this um, and you can contact me um, directly and, and we've, we've got a blog and um, 
uh, some videos and some great content. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Jacob. That's a great overview. Um, really fascinating to see the the, the complex value chain and the, the digital tools that are underpinning the this specialization. And um, I'm sure that um, many people have got got some questions, but um, I'll ask you to to park them, and we'll um, we'll proceed to the the panel discussion. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our other two panelists. Hugh Whelan is Group CEO of Peg Africa. He's been recognised as a top 30 under 30 Australian entrepreneur, a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, and was recently named an Aspen Global Leadership Fellow. Hugh, can I ask you to introduce Peg Africa in 60 seconds? And you, uh, you will need to unmute yourself first. <laughs> There you go. There we go. Hey, um, cool. hi everyone. Uh, Hugh here. Um, I am the CEO of PEG. We are a West Africa focused uh, pay as you go solar company. We operate in three markets in West Africa Ghana, Ivory Coast, and Senegal. But about 400 uh, staff across those markets. Um, and we focus on, uh, we're, a, we're a generation two pay as you go company. So we focus on consumer financing, distribution. Um, and kind of outsource hardware, software. Cool, thanks Hugh. Good to have you on the webinar today. Now, Leslie Marincola is the CEO and co-founder of Angaza, uh, a product designer and mechanical engineer from Stanford University, who's also worked as a design engineer on the Amazon Kindle team. Leslie is a two-time Tech Awards laureate, was named a Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur, is an echoing Green Fellow and a 2018 Scholar Awardee. Leslie, great uh, that you can join us today. Can you introduce Angaza quickly? Sure, absolutely. Good morning or evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, so Angaza is a technology company serving last mile distribution businesses in emerging markets. Um, Jacob set this up very nicely. We focus on the technology piece of the value chain. So our pay as you go technology platform makes life-changing products from solar lighting systems to solar water pumps, affordable to rural off-grid homes around the globe. Um, we're a B2B horizontally integrated company. So this means that we focus on scaling through the formation of two types of partnerships, uh, directly with product manufacturers that build the hardware and product distributors that sell that hardware to end consumers. Um, we were founded in 2012. We have over 50 employees across our San Francisco and Nairobi offices. A large majority of those employees are product and engineering employees because we're a technology business. Uh, we currently work with over 150 distributors across 30 countries around the globe. So really have been a part of seeing pay-as-you-go spread worldwide. And I'm really proud to say that our partners have sold over 1 million pay-as-you-go solar products on our technology platform to date. Cool, fantastic. Thanks, Leslie. And yeah, especially for joining from California, where it's still fairly early in the morning. Um, cool. So the, the first set of questions I'd like to to talk about is a, a look at the kind of the, the new and evolving business models, and uh, how technology and bundling is is playing out. Now, Leslie, you saw this opportunity ahead of time. You said you were formed in in 2012. Um, so so you saw this at an early stage, and and what? What made you confident that this, this was the, the way to go? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, when we were just starting out, uh, pay as you go was definitely not a household term. Um, mm. But what we saw was that there was already specialization in the industry. There were manufacturers that were producing these solar devices, and there were distributors that were specializing in distribution um, to sell those devices to end users. And these were often separate organizations who were actually partnering together to deliver energy access solutions to consumers. Um, so they weren't necessarily pay-as-you-go companies. They, might, they were probably selling those devices for upfront cash to end users. But when you looked at the whole market, there was actually uh, you know, a large swath of the market that was already specializing in a particular piece of the value chain. 
Um, so we saw that. Um, we also saw just a pervasive problem facing the whole industry, and that was the lack of consumer financing options for quality solar products. Um, mm -hmm. And we founded Agaza based on two principles. One, we wanted to solve that problem of the lack of consumer financing um, and essentially focus on building a solution for end user financing, which we saw as one of the biggest energy access challenges. And we decided to do that with a B2B or business to business model because we wanted to take advantage of the specialization that already existed in the market. And we thought that by focusing on the technology, we could most effectively you know, develop and deliver a solution to that problem at scale. Um, and we started bringing together partners both on the manufacturing side and the distribution side um, pretty early on. And you know, a lot of the early distributors that we worked with um, introduced a pay-as-you-go model to their operations. So whereas they were selling upfront cash products, they saw the ability for pay-as-you-go to increase the number of consumers that they could sell to, and thus they added pay-as-you-go. Mm -hmm. cool. Let me ask about the your offering to, to distributors. So you offer the software platform, the cloud services, and do you also provide guidance on on the business model and such as you know pricing and some of the consumer insights that you've learned with working through the you know such a wide range of distributors yeah absolutely um we certainly help distributors especially ones that are new to pay as you go think through all the you know moving parts of setting up a pay as you go business including mm -hmm. pricing of the product um, that being said we are careful to recognize that you know, we work across 30 countries now and mm -hmm. pricing a solar home system in one market may be very different from pricing that same piece of hardware in an entirely different market. Um, so we make sure that we're careful to provide you know, recommendations based on industry best practices that we've seen. But at the end of the day, it's always the distributor's decision, how they price their products, how they run their operations, what kind of follow-up they have with their client base, et cetera. Right, right. Uh, and how do your client uh your distributor clients select which which hard hardware to go for what choices do they have yeah so right now we we partner with over 15 manufacturers so we have a very wide range of pay-as-you-go product offerings basically from smaller portable solar lighting systems through um i think our sweet spot the most popular type of product are the 6 to 12 watt solar home systems um, and then we support uh, solar home systems that are up to hundreds of watts that can power you know, household appliances. Um, we also have a number of um, distributors that started out selling pay-as-you-go solar home systems and have now uh, increased just the variety of products that they sell to their client base. So they might have introduced smartphones or cook stoves as well um, and sold those on a pay-as-you-go basis. So this is, this is sort of an exciting um, trend that we're seeing in the industry is solar distributors thinking outside of just the solar lighting space to provide other life-changing products to their clients. Yeah, nice, nice. And so um, it, it's common for a, for a distributor to offer um, hardware from a number of different manufacturers to kind of see what fits their, their market and their customer base and they, they have the ability to kind of uh, pick and choose from, from the range of, um, of um, manufacturing partners that Angaza has. Cool. Hugh, um, tell me about the, the PEG uh, business model. I mean, how, is, how have you um, been influenced by the, this technology and bundling? And um, you know, how did you uh, go about um, you know, designing your, your business model and your partnerships? Yeah, so I, I started in 2009 with a crowdfunding site focused on energy lending. Uh, we worked in East and West Africa financing uh, you know, solar home systems, solar lanterns, and cook stoves. And uh, around that time, the barefoot firefly, for those of you who've been around long enough, was the hot, sexy product on the market. Um, and uh, the crowdfunding site, uh, you know, had lenders from 35 countries and uh, got a lot of media attention but couldn't pay my salary. No one wanted to fund me. <laughs> so um, I ended up uh, setting up a an asset financing and distribution business, uh, I suppose, an, an, uh, an early version of a, of a pay-as-you-go company in Ghana, but focused on MFI partners because pay-as-you-go didn't exist at that point. 
Um, and between 2009 and 2011, the market had moved from solar lanterns to plug and play solar home systems. They were kind of dumb solar home systems um, being sold mostly for cash or through MFIs and financing. But I, I saw the hardware market evolving quickly. Uh, and then in 2013, when I started PEG with my co-founder, Nate Heller, um, it was the beginnings of, of pay as you go solar. So again, in two years, we'd moved from kind of dumb solar to smart solar. And uh, I just, I, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to get involved in hardware uh, because I saw that the evolution was happening so quickly, it would involve a lot of resources. Uh, and around that time, there were some companies starting to set up, which were looking sophisticated, like MCOPA, um, which had, you know, a vertical offering. And we wanted to stand on the shoulder of giants rather than reinvent what they'd already done. Um, and so in uh, 2014, we partnered with MCOPA. Um, and in 2014, we kind of made the decision that we would license hardware and software because others were doing it better than we ever would. Uh, and that was a risky bet. We definitely had some sleepless nights because we were making this this uh, this bet that the market would be there, that somebody would license to us uh, and that the market would evolve, that there'd be lots of offerings. We thought it would go that way, but it, it, it was a big risk when we did it. Um, and, you know, we're very pleased to see that the market's kind of moved in that direction and there are multiple hardware and multiple software providers who are offering sophisticated um, solutions to companies like PEG. So what we focus on is the is profitably servicing the customer, basically everything in country. Um, so we want to control the customer experience. Uh, we do the consumer financing. And we're focused on West Africa as a region because we want to be the experts in building a consumer financing business in that area. And we think that it's different enough and hard enough that uh, if we focus on it, we'll be, we'll be the best at it. Um, and uh, one, one final point I'd, I'd mention, having seen what's happened from 2009 to 2009 till now, uh, it is very clear the market has moved to this kind of unbundling phase and the, the market power is shifting a little bit. So when we started being a licensor of software and hardware, literally there was one company who had licensed to us and, uh, and they, we were lucky enough that they were MCOPA. You know, they were uh, the, the company at that time um, and we learned a hell of a lot from them. Um, but, you know, if they had decided to drop licensing, we were done. There was, there was no other kind of solution out there that we felt could have built the business the way that we wanted to build it. Um, and that's not the case these days. Um, companies like us have options and, uh, and that is a great thing to see. It gives us a lot, it gives us a safety net. Yeah, fantastic. And, and in fact, you've, you've moved on from MCOPA now and you have a new technology partner, is that right? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're, we're partnered with uh, D-Lite. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, is that is that now the your one and only uh, tech partner? Um, yeah. So I I pretty firmly range. believe that these types of business model, you know, our, our choice of business model, which is focusing on consumer financing and distribution, um, real, you you have to invest deeply in relationships. Uh, you it's very hard to have many relationships with many suppliers. Um, it just sucks up too much of your time and it becomes too complex. So you need to invest heavily in personal relationships with the people on the other end who are, you know, your partners. And that means that you want deep long-term relationships, not kind of short-term fleeting ones that mean that you might get some short-term advantage, but you lose the kind of long-term uh, strategic edge that you might gain from those deep, those deep relationships. Mm -hmm. Cool. Interesting. Thank you. Jacob, um, we talked about the, the the technology and the business. Can you talk to the the consumers' experience of this, from the vertically integrated to the, the Paygo 2.0 company? You know, is a customer aware of the you know the the different models? Um, you know, is it a better, worse experience? How, how is it playing out for them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think there's certainly in, in a number of the markets in East Africa an awareness 
of uh, just next generation offerings just by virtue of the number of products that are on the market. In terms of the customer experience, I think it's actually hard to say definitively. Like I, I think certainly what's better in general is that in customers have more options in more geographies. Um, and if you're a second generation Pago operator, um, you know, you should be in a position to be able to respond to the needs of your unique customers um, because you can pick and choose hardware that fits your own market. Um, and I would expect as this is, um, you know, as more and more companies are deploying Pago, we're going to see competition heat up on the terms of the customer financing offering. So not just on the hardware, but on the financial product. Um, which I expect will be good for customers. I think maybe a question mark in my head is just um, whether there will be clarity around brand identity with hardware um, and maybe the Pago model itself. So, you know, you could have, I guess, multiple Pago companies selling the same yellow Pago ready solar kit. Um, and if one of them isn't executing very well um, in that market, is it Pago that gets a bad name? Is that particular yellow product um, that that has has the reputational hit? Um, and so I, th I think maybe it's it's a bit of a mix at the moment um, in terms of customer experience. Mm -hmm. Cool. I now have a a poll question for for our audience. I've just opened this. Um, the, the question is, which feature of technology and bundling will be the most important driver of Pago market expansion? So I'd, I invite the, the audience to um, put down, um, fill that out. We have uh, the option of new types of business models, new types of companies taking on distribution, increased profitability of companies in the Pago value chain, increased tech innovation from specialized tech firms, or something completely different. Oh, and I'll give you another 20 seconds to, to fill that out. At the moment, we have increased profitability of companies leading the way. Still some more answers coming in. With, uh, tech innovation is uh, catching up. But, but it seems that these two are the leaders. Jacob, do you um, do you agree with our esteemed audience? Jacob, uh, can you uh, can you see the results as well, or am I, is it only? I, I apologize. I was on mute. Yes. Yeah, I see the results as well. Yep. Yeah, uh, increased profitability and increased tech innovation from specialists. Yep. I, I I do agree actually because I think um, I think the second point is in my presentation what I was trying to describe as uh, really a driver of business model innovation, right? Um, so if we if we continue to see innovation in in companies that are specializing in different pieces of the technology value chain. Um, I think it makes it a lot easier and more comfortable um, for companies to partner on pieces of their business model. Um, and I, you know, we can come back to Hugh's description of the early days when when they started doing this, really only having one option available. Um, if we can start seeing that increase um, in innovation and number of providers doing that, then I can see that um, you know really uh, improving the ability to unbundle different pieces for sure. Mm -hmm. Do, do you agree, Leslie? What's your perspective? Sorry, I can't actually see the final results. It still says it's in progress. Oh, really? Okay. Um, let me close. Let me see. Oops. Sorry, I'm just playing with the. Okay. You should now be able to share the results. Sorry, I thought they were visible for everyone. Um, can you now see them? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, so um, the well, increased profitability uh, wins out over the tech innovation from specialized tech firms. Yeah, I I definitely agree with those leading top two. Um, just as Jacob said, I think 
as we start to see more successful companies in the industry, then an increasing number of companies will follow that for sure. Um, and of course, I'm I'm biased because I, I run a t tech company, but um, I think increased tech innovation on the smart hardware side of things, on the ability especially to um, collect usage and monitor usage and monitoring data back from the products um, opens up a whole range of opportunities, especially when you get into um, thinking about predictive data analytics and how they can help distributors make smarter decisions um, about their operational choices. Yeah, interesting. And, and Hugh, as a Pago 2.0 company, can you speak to this point on profitability? I mean, what's, I mean, the, the hypothesis is that it's, um, you know, as Jacob said, you know, you don't have the same uh, equity requirements on a lot of the the, the tech R and D, and you know, you have a, a shorter runway to to profitability. But on on the other hand, perhaps it's more difficult to to raise capital without a, a sexy tech innovation to sell to investors. Um, what's been uh, what's been Peg's experience on this? Uh, yeah, our experience might be a little bit different from others, just because we were so early on uh, that uh, when we were trying to raise money, and it was in West Africa too, which was a region that wasn't attracting financing uh, in those early days for this business model. Um, uh, it was really hard. It was really hard, and we actually had to attract investors who. Uh, didn't invest in, you know, weren't energy investors. Um, and we kind of ended up uh, getting investment from some unusual investors who've been great for us. Um, but I do think profitability is the number one thing that this industry as a whole needs to show. And profitability is the thing that will end up uh, driving investor interest and eventually driving some exits. And I think a big uh, a big juicy exit is is the best thing that could happen to this industry uh, because it will it will generate a lot of attention and uh, it will be the thing that drives even more investor interest, even more promising entrepreneurs coming into the space, uh, etc. Because while we uh, all think that this industry is uh, is doing great and and we think it's uh, it's well known the fact is a lot of people still don't know about it um, so yeah we've got to get profitable and there's got to be a couple of exits and then I think we'll see some some real some real game changers yeah yeah and um, yeah I, I wonder if peg Africa will be uh, one of the the leaders in that respect as well <laughs> sometimes I dream about it yeah uh, one, one of the other options, Leslie, was that um, uh, new types of, uh, of companies were able to do, um, you know, to do distribution or play in the, the Pago uh, value chain. Um, you know, clearly, Angas has got a, a unique perspective on this with, uh, you know, 150 distribution partners. I mean, uh, have you seen the, the profile of distributors change over the course of the, the years? Are you now seeing more local entrepreneurs and national companies, um, you know, be, be interested and successful in this? Yeah, you know, if I had to vote for one of these, that might have been the one. Um, I think we've seen a lot of innovation variety in terms of the type of distribution companies that are playing in the page you go solar market. Um, so certainly we see a wide range of sizes and um, a mixture of, you know, local sort of, sort of more grassroots distributors um, and then distributors who are um, typically run by expats. They might have their headquarters in the US or Europe, but they have established local operations across various regions or various countries and emerging markets. Um, I'll, I'll sort of profile two types of companies that we're particularly excited about that are sort of new entrants to the pay-as-you-go solar market. Um, whereas before the quote typical distributor was really a distributor that um, from its beginning was focused on the distribution of solar home systems to consumers. Um, now we're seeing, uh, for example, microfinance institutions who, you know, these are organizations that are used to administering cash loans to consumers. Um, but they are now sort of adding a layer of hardware distribution on top of their existing agent network um, such that they can offer these, these hardware solutions to that same group of consumers. And interestingly enough, a lot of these microfinance institutions are targeting a different sort of tier of buying power of consumers with pay-as-you-go solar. 
They might offer a pay-as-you-go solar system to a consumer that might not have qualified for their cash loan, but they can learn a lot about that um, consumer's you know, buying power and risk level, and hopefully, ideally, eventually get them to um, be eligible for their cash loan program. So microfinance institutions are really exciting just because they have a large network of uh, rural distribution already. Um, one other one I want to profile are telecoms. Um, telecoms have very, very wide networks in emerging markets um, of agents, typically uh, agents who are involved in the distribution of airtime or mobile money agents. And a number of telecoms are starting to realize the opportunity of actually selling hardware, selling pay-as-you-go hardware through these same distribution networks. Um, I would say it's you know sort of slow moving to get off the ground because a lot of these tele telecoms are giant companies that that do move pretty slowly. But the fact that a number of them are starting to recognize the opportunity to sell additional you know services to their client base um, and really reinforce their own brand, uh, we think is really exciting because it couldn't really open up the scale of this market. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, for sure, the I mean the the market is, you know, uh, is so huge. Um, it's you know there's um, the, the new businesses, um, new entrants. Uh, you know, must um, must be uh, lo looking at this and um, you know uh, enticed by uh, some of the opportunities that it brings. Now, I'd I'd like uh, to invite the the audience to. To ask some questions, please type it in the in the question box. Whilst you whilst you think and type, I'd like to ask Jacob to to look into the the future and um, see how how you see unbundling this unbundling trend playing out in the next few years. I mean, Leslie's just talked about the the new profiles um, the of, of entrants coming into the market. Is it is um, are there, are there other features you see beyond this, um, and what do you expect? Is there a PayGo 3.0 on the horizon? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, I think that PayGo 3.0 label. I think there's there's certainly potential for operators to start to decouple their consumer finance business, and there's some great work that that um, that Dan Waldron um, and Alex um, um, Sotirio. At, uh, at CGAP have written on this actually as kind of a potential PAYGO 3.0 where the consumer finance business is unbundled. I think that's one possibility. Um, I do see more vertically integrated players unbundling pieces. So um, that could either be driven by an opportunity with a technology provider, but it also could be to more easily enter a, a new mark, a new market, sorry. Um, and and maybe give up a piece that 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 a local partner might be able to do better than you. Um, and and I actually expect to see maybe one or two more vertically integrated players experiment with spinning off their Pego platforms. It would it would actually surprise me if we wouldn't see that. Um, and and I guess the other piece would be um, it, you know this is already happening on Gaza and others are doing it, but Pego tech really being applied to products in other sectors. So starting with things that are maybe adjacent, like microgrids, cooking, water, um, which I think will also continue to expand the pool of companies using those core tools, but then all of the companies that are specializing um, in supporting Pago at different pieces of the value chain can then start to look at those adjacent sectors in the future um, as they start to use Pago as a main way of making their product and service uh, affordable and accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Talking about the, you know, those supporting services, we have a question here from Andrew Aldridge. Is access to local currency financing key to the growth of Pago businesses in Africa to leverage the consumer finance opportunity? And what are the barriers here? Hugh, I think you've got a, an interesting perspective on that. Yeah, I think that local currency financing is important for risk mitigation. <clears throat> I think the, the industry grew basically without it for the first three, four years uh, and, you know, probably luckily avoided some major catastrophe. Um, I do think it's really important. Uh, local currency financing is uh, more expensive. Uh, you know, the interest rate is more expensive. You'll you'll load more expense on your P&L. You'll obviously avoid the risk of of a significant depreciation, 
Uh, I think the industry can grow without it, but not sustainably. So I think it is very important. And I also think that local banks uh, and regional banks and even some international banks are starting to get very interested. So I'd be surprised if we didn't see a number of, you know, deals involving banks over the next 12 months even. Mm -hmm. Now, where will that be? Is that going to come out of the East African markets, which are more more established? Uh, no, I think it's I think it's uh, you know all over Africa. I think the banks are figuring out this is an opportunity, and they're trying to understand how to get into it. Okay, interesting. And another question on uh, related to to finance and sales. Um, to what extent will better ways of assessing customer credit and credit scoring matter to scaling the sector and opening up opening this up to more investors or is this just a big rabbit hole i was asked by andrea griffin leslie would you like to field that question sure um yeah we we believe very strongly that the sort of next level of maturity of a lot of these pago operators will come from really being able to understand the client risk levels um, and taking action on that. So I guess I want to first clarify, um, you know, when we think about client credit scoring, this doesn't mean should you sell to a client or should you not. It could mean should you sell a three watt product to that client or a 20 watt product to that client. So it's really sizing the offering to that particular client and then um, really helping drive a lot of the operational decisions that happen post sale. So, you know, if a client looks like they're falling off a, the, expected payment trajectory, what sort of action should a distributor take to follow up with that client and make sure they know how to use the technology and make payments, for example. So, um, you know, I think the question was, is it a rabbit hole? <laughs> Definitely, uh, I think we need to be careful that it probably is not the same um, data model that should be used in every single case across every single market or product or client base. Um, but I think there is a, a a ton of information that um, payment client and product data can bring to just um, you know really help make these distribution companies uh, profitable because they're selling to the right they're selling the right product to the right set of clients. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Um, so it's it's just a matter of assessing the, the the right product for the right client and understanding what is what is what is that ability to pay and finding the finding the right match. Um, we do have a couple more questions, but sadly we're, we're out of time. So I will um, uh, try and um, ensure that they are, they're answered offline and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask our panelists to, to, to help me there and send the, the askers uh, the answers. Um, but yeah, let me just uh, wrap up now with a couple of finishing slides. Uh, this is a pitch for a, a Gogler study on the taxonomy for off-grid energy companies, and um, this uh, this is this is a study that um, that breaks down uh, sorry, the. Drew, we still see yeah. the uh, the poll, I think. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, figure out how to. There you go. Is that back on my screen? Cool. Thanks, Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. So the, this study is um, it breaks down the the different um, uh, elements of a, a business model and lists a range of options for each of the the, the strategic strategic questions that a, a paygo business um, may uh, may ask itself. Um, so for example, here we're looking at the consumer financing type and the, the different options that are there. And it's a very you know structured way to to approaching designing your own paygo. So if I was looking to design a Pago business model, I'd say this would be my starting point. And if you're interested, find it on the Gogler website. As I mentioned at the, the start of this webinar, this is the first in a series of um, technology and business innovation uh, webinars and blogs and events that uh, Gogler is running. We're looking for um, we're looking for more ideas. You know, we're we're interested to hear. You know, your innovations and your experiences and structure uh, future websites around that. Um, you know, that we're thinking to do it around machine learning, data analytics, uh, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. If you have any any ideas and cool experiences that you want to share, please get in touch. Um, and finally, uh, if you want to 
see this uh, recording, you know, pass it to your colleagues or anyone else that you may be interested. You can find it on the, the Google website and YouTube. You get information about upcoming webinars uh, on the Google site or sign up for our newsletters. And also I would um, uh, encourage people to fill in the, the evaluation for the webinar. I will send around a link to a survey monkey just after after we've closed the webinar and if people could fill out fill out the four questions then that's going to help us um, improve our, our design and delivery of future events but with that we've hit the hour i'd like to say thank you very much to jacob leslie and hugh for um, sharing their insights with us today and thank you to all of the attendees for joining as well um, thanks Drew. Cool. thanks everybody thanks everyone Cool. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, you. Thank have you. A, yeah. Bye. Great. Have a good day. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, guys.